So uh, welcome to my talk on two topics I'm very passionate about, uh, Rust, the language, and game development in general. Um, I'm Herbert Wolverson, and <clears throat> I'm going to be, uh, cover three main topic areas today. Um, who am I? So, you know, who is Herbert? How did I get into Rust? Um, how, how did I get into game development? And hopefully why you should listen to me. Uh, then uh, we're going to look at making a game, uh, Flappy Dragon. It's only a couple of hundred lines of Rust code. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and it's a good example of how Rust can uh, be very productive for making a game. And then we're going to look at the Rust game development ecosystem overall, looking at a few of the engines that are starting to come along, uh, looking at the uh, explosive growth in Rust use in the game industry. And then we'll open up for questions. Uh, first of all, um, I'm like I said, I'm Herbert Wolverson. Um, I use the pronouns he, him. Um, I recently published a book in beta called Hands on Rust. Uh, the book is currently available in beta on Prague Prague. We'll talk a lot more about that in a moment. Uh, before I did that, I put up a Rust roguelike tutorial. I'll be talking about that again. Um, I'm in the process of publishing The Making of Secbot, which was a ga game I made for a Make a Game in Seven Day Challenge. Um, <clears throat> I'll be sure to include some links to that in the uh, po in the post about the about this presentation afterwards. Um, over the last decade or so, I've worked on Nox Futura, which is basically Minecraft in space. Uh, One Night in the Dungeon, which was an Unreal Engine um, roguelike. Secbot, which was the seven day challenge. Tech Support, the roguelike, which is a uh, fun mini game I used to uh, learn some modern C++. Uh, the idea was that you uh, receive missions and have to avoid your managers or vendors because they depress you into uh, quitting the industry. And Apocalypse Taxi, which is a just a general procedural generation um, game I made for fun that just makes random cities and has you drive around being a taxi driver. So many, many years ago, I, many more years than I should admit for my age, um, my dad was working at a local community college and was teaching computer skills. And one day he brought home a BBC Micro Model B, which is the computer that's pictured there, um, I guess a nerd on the right. Um, it had uh, BBC Basic built into it. And BBC Basic is a lot like regular Basic. It just supports functions and procedures um, it's a little closer to a modern Visual Basic. Now, I was at the tender age of six or seven at the time, and it wasn't long before I was starting to get fed up with just the games that were on the intro, intro tape. Uh, yep, we loaded games from cassette back then into all 32K of RAM. Um, so my dad started showing me uh, Basic. Uh, you're, you can see on the right what's probably the first program most people write when they pick up a Boosie Micro. Um, hello world. And back then, the norm was that magazines came out. They were absolutely chock full of source code. You carefully copied the source code onto your screen, saved it, ran it, and usually nothing worked. So then you got a crash course in debugging. And this is actually a really good way to learn a language because you have to start picking up a bit of understanding of what's going on, even though it's often complicated and over your head. Um, but after a while, you start figuring out, okay, I typed that wrong. And because you're looking at it, you start to get an understanding of, well, I see why this works. And then you, as I got older, it started turning into things like, well, this game would be more fun if I had more lives. So I'd find a bit of code that let me change that. And so uh, this really got me started on a trajectory throughout my life so far, in which whenever I want to learn a new programming language, I do so by writing some simple games. And I really find that brings the fun into it, and I wanted to share some of that fun. So over the last decade or so, I was primarily writing um, games in C or C++ using GCC and Visual Studio. I actually got started out with text-based MUDs, you know, the old ones where the console says, you are in a 10 foot by 10 foot room. There is a hole in the ground here. And if somebody else who's logged into the same system comes in, it'll tell you Herbert is here. And you might interact, you might not. But it's <clears throat> very um, simple text-based stuff, but it's an awful lot of fun. Then I started getting into tile-based games, um, Angband, NetHack, that sort of thing. 
and started bringing, working on bringing in graphics to those. I uh, became completely addicted to Dwarf Fortress, um, which I still think is the best game ever. And Nox Futura is, I think, at some point in people's lives, everybody decides that they're going to make a Dwarf Fortress, and Nox Futura is my attempt at that. There's a pretty decent C++ version, and the uh, Rust version's coming along. But then I got into One Night in the Dungeon, my first effort at trying to use the Unreal Engine. Oops. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to skip yet. The uh, <clears throat> Unreal is fantastic in that you can lay out your maps, write a lot of code, things work. And it's a real pain in that you allocate memory, do something with it, and Unreal actually has a garbage collector, but you're never quite sure when it's going to run. And you very quickly start tying yourself in knots with uh, maybe this object exists, maybe it doesn't. And likewise, when you're threading, uh, you, particularly when you're sending events in bet between actors, it gets pretty muddy as to uh, which thread the event will fire on, what exactly will happen. And I started getting into fun problems that on my relative potato development computer, my game would run great. Um, give it to somebody running a absolute monster with tons of cores and lots of RAM, and things would randomly break. So I was finding that painful, and <clears throat> I'd been talking to quite a few people on various discords, and I'd been hearing that all the cool kids were now starting to dabble with this language called Rust. So I wanted to know, is this going to help me? And from what they were saying, it sounded like it was going to be a really good fit. Because first of all, Rust won't let you do really stupid things with memory. And believe me, I was getting really good at doing stupid things with memory. And multi-threaded synchronization is Rust's other big strong point. Um, I've seriously never used a language that uh, made threading so easy, and that's just that's just lovely. So um, the uh, roguelike dev forum on Reddit was running a uh, let's make a roguelike. Uh, they do this every summer. Uh, typically, they provide a tutorial in Python uh, using a, lang um, a library called libpcod. Well, I decided, OK, well, I, I know this much Python, and I've written this in C, so I'm going to follow along with the tutorial, but I'm going to concurrently try and write it in Rust, <coughs> use it to learn Rust. And it was a, you know, a little bit of a rocky start, but uh, the uh, program you can see running on the right side of the slide was the result. I made it all the way through the tutorial. Um, I did prove the old adage that if you write C for long enough, then sooner or later you can write C in any language. I quickly started to realize, yes, this works. I like Rust. I need to go back and I need to create this in good Rust. Um, because I really wanted to uh, provide some solid underpinnings, I created BracketLib. Um, BracketLib is a lot like libtcod, which is, it's primarily a virtual console. Uh, it can compile to uh, native GL, uh, run in curses if you want to use it over SSH, um, compile into a uh, WebAssembly. It's uh, <coughs> relatively flexible. I actually made version 0.01 in a day, and most of that was spent figuring out OpenGL bindings. Um, over the next uh, couple of years or so, it's gained just about everything from pathfinding to field of view. And it did this as I was working on the, uh, uh, um, taking my uh, seven day, sorry, um, seven week learn Rust by making a roguelike and turning it into good Rust, which became the Rust roguelike tutorial that I've linked on the screen there. Um, it started out as eight chapters and it's now up to 74 and I'm still not done. I'm really enjoying it, really enjoying the feedback I get, and I'm really excited to be able to open source everything, share it back with the community. The uh, Rust community is just fantastic. Um, I've seriously never worked with a group of people more willing to take the time to help you, more willing to uh, read through your utterly broken code on GitHub, and instead of flaming you, send you friendly PRs to just tell you, hey, you know, you can do this and save yourself 100 lines of code or not do something dumb. And <clears throat> I've yet to encounter somebody who's angry or mean about it. And really, that is one of the biggest draws of Rust for me, is having a friendly community that just wants to help really, really makes uh, working with it on a daily basis so much easier. 
So as the tutorial grew, um, Erland Sokenhalen from the Amethyst Foundation got in touch with me. Um, Amethyst was absorbing Specs, the uh, one of the libraries that I was using in the tutorial. <coughs> and uh, because they were uh, curating Specs, and the tutorial spends a lot of time using it, um, they onboarded uh, the Rust tutorial into the Amethyst Foundation. Um, they were also talking to a company called the Pragmatic Publishers, Pragprog, about uh, getting a book about game, Rust game development. Um, the publisher liked what they saw from the tutorial. After a few weeks, it was decided that I would create Hands on Rust, which initially started that life known as Learn Rust by Making a Game. Um, and that book is currently on it, winging its way to production. I'll give you some details about it in a minute. Um, now for this <coughs> next section, we're going to be looking at a game called Flappy Dragon, um, Flappy Bird. This is the uh, third chapter in Hands on Rust. Um, it's, Flappy Bird has very much become the hello world of game programming, and for quite a few reasons. First of all, it's a great way to try a new language. It's simple enough that even writing it low level, you're not going to need more than one file worth of code. A couple of hundred lines of Rust is enough to get you a relatively polished implementation. You know, I personally think that Flappy Bird is a fun game, so I enjoy making it. I've made it in a few languages, and it's a great way, once you've written it in one language, it's great to implement it in another so that you can start to get a feel for uh, how the different languages uh, flow together, much like you go to the Hello World collection to get an idea of, you know, hey, Rust is a really tourist language, and, you know, Perl is really readable when you haven't decided to be clever. Um, and also, very importantly to me, uh, Flappy Bird is very easy to prototype without graphics and then add the graphics in later. Now, I've seen way too many game development projects over the years fail because they come up with a great idea, and it usually is a good idea. They task the artists, they spend a really long time making everything beautiful, and then they play the game and discover, well, this is not fun. We have to make some pretty big changes. So uh, whenever I start a project, I try to stick to very simple, if it's 3D, basic cube sphere type things. If it's um, 2D, I pretty much usually start with ASCII or something hand-drawn in Microsoft Paint. Um, you, that way you're keeping it simple. Once you've got a prototype that works, you know the game is fun. And once the game is fun, you can make it beautiful. It's a lot harder to go the other way around because your poor artists start to get really fed up with you on the 30-second time that you ask them to change everything. So when you look at Flappy Bird, uh, what makes it up? Well, first of all, Flappy is a bird. Or in this case, I'm making Flappy Dragon, so he's a dragon. Nobody really knows why he likes flying east so much, but he's obviously on a mission of some kind. Now, Flappy Bird is great because there's only one control, flap, which adds upward velocity. You press the flap control, you flap upwards. Conversely, you've continually got gravity pulling you down towards the bottom. If you fall off the bottom of the screen, you're dead. There's also, because uh, otherwise this would be a really simple game, um, obstacles appearing on the screen. You have to try and dodge the obstacles. If you hit them, once again, you're a dead bird. So, um, how would you go about building yourself, your very own Flappy Dragon in Rust? Um, <clears throat> So when you do Cargo New and create your project, you find yourself looking at Hello World. Now the problem with uh, follow with just starting typing and printing out your level is that uh, games work a little differently from console programs. Um, your operating system is continually sending you a stream of events. It might be telling you the mouse moved over here, somebody moved the window, somebody resized the window, somebody closed the program even. Or, you know, if they want to give you nightmare fuel, somebody dragged the window to between two monitors, each of which has a different display scaling. And under the hood, you find yourself having to worry about most of these. And that's why Bracketlib um, simplifies things a little bit. Well, but instead of uh, a typical console program, which blocks every time it's waiting for input, you want to keep running. So if you were, you could do this purely in a console using threads, 
or using non-blocking I.O. And it starts to get messy and not very cross-platform. And it also starts to get stuttery when you start to build a really big game. So to support, so pretty much every game out there uses a game loop. Now, um, game loops typically start up by doing all of the interaction required with the operating system to actually get a window on the screen. In some cases, that can be a lot more work than you might think. Uh, for example, I've seen simple uh, Vulkan or WGPU initialization wind up at four or 500 lines of code. <clears throat> and you need to make that cross-platform, not worry about it too much. So generally let the library do that for you. And then going into the loop, um, at the beginning of the loop, you your uh, library will be asking the operating system, so tell me what's going on, pulling, pulling it for state. And you'll start getting notice that the cursor moved, keys were pressed. Um, you might get notice that somebody wants to quit altogether. And if you're still going, then you call it, then the library calls into your program's tick function. And tick is your interface with the universe. We'll be writing one in just a second. Uh, tick typically runs 30 or more times a second because it's running every time the operating system is refreshing your screen. Um, most of the time, your tick function will check to see what state your program is in and render what needs to be done. It might also declare, well, you've called me too quickly. I'm not going to do anything. Call me back later. And that's fine. So when it comes out of the tick function, it's then up to the library to take the whatever data it has that describes what you want to be on the screen and actually put it there. And again, you start getting into um, fun with Ever, with uh, making sure that this applies to the exact platform you're writing on. So for example, you might be talking to Vulkan, you might be talking to OpenGL or Metal, and ideally your library should abstract that away from you, and that's uh, probably three quarters of the code in bracket lib. So then it says, well, have we been told we need to quit? If you have, then it tears everything down, which again is more work than you might think. If it hasn't, then you go back to step two and you Look for look for uh, more information, and the game just keeps on looping through this until there's nothing else to do. So this is Hello Bracket Terminal implemented using Bracketlib. Um, we'll be going over the elements of this in a second, but just to give you an overview, at the top you've got uh, um, the Prelude, which imports um, all of the things that I thought were important enough that you might need them. Uh, from Bracketlib. State, which is a structure, we'll talk about that in a second, that def defines everything your program needs to remember while it's running. Because every time it goes into tick, it's not going to have any other way to remember what its previous state was. Every call to tick is independent. Then there's the tick function itself. And at the very bottom, we initialize the library. So let's start by taking a look at that. Here in the main function, uh, we're using bterm builder to request an 80 by 50 text console. Now this is what's called the builder pattern, and you see it all the time in REST. Uh, you typically start with a function that describes the basic outline of what you want. Then you call more and more with functions chained together like this. So in this case, we're specifying the window title should be Flappy Dragon. And then at the end of the builder pattern, there's usually a function called build, or something similar, that when you call it, uh, sets all, combines all of the features that you described and uh, pulls them together into some sort of overall description of what you want. It's, uh, I find it a much more friendly approach to writing configuration than you know, either a giant INI file or um, typing or having to remember every single little setting in a giant list of 30, 40 parameters that you might wind up with if you wanted to include everything. The other thing to notice here is one of my favorite features of Rust, uh, main returns b error, which is the how I describe errors within the bracket library. And you've got a little question mark right after build. So I could also write dot expect and then a nice message saying failed to initialize. Or I could just unwrap it, and in the event of an error, it crashes completely. What the question mark does is it says, well, if this function returns an error and I encounter an error, I'll simply bail out and and the Rust runtime will display the error. Um, or if you wanted to, you can be calling this from inside other functions, catch them, and try and handle it. And then we've got the context. We made the state object. 
So we call into main loop and we pass it state, which currently doesn't have any data in it. Now structures are just like objects in other languages. They're a way of combining data together to uh, um, store it together. In this case, for hello world, we really don't have anything that we need to remember from the previous frame. So we implement game state, which is a trait. A trait is basically an interface. Um, when you, you know, bracket lib requires that you implement game state for your main program. Um, game state require, in order to function, game state requires that you have a tick. Um, the mmut self, I always thought was a little ugly, but it means it can see the contents of that instance of state. And ctx context is just a link to the terminal itself, gives you various commands. In this case, it clears the screen with CLS and it prints hello bracket terminal on the screen. Now, the nice way thing about doing it with traits like that is that bracket lib doesn't have to know anything about how your program works. It just guarantees that as long as you follow the contract of communicating with, with the library through this interface, your program will work. And as long as I don't break the interface, I can update bracket lib and your program will continue to work. All right, so next up, now that we've looked at the basic what goes into Flappy Dragon and we've looked at how to get Hello World onto the screen, we're going to look at the general control flow that defines what uh, Flappy Bird looks like. It's actually got one of the most simple general flows you'll find, very common one. When you launch the program, it shows you a menu asking you, would you like to play the game or quit? If you choose to play, then obviously the game runs. Sooner or later, it's inevitable the uh, player will die. Um, just like taxes, you can't avoid gravity and obstacles forever. When that happens, you go to a screen that tells you game over, hopefully tells you your score, and you have the option of playing again or bailing out and quitting. So it's relatively simple. Now, one of, I love REST enumerations. They uh, are very detailed. Um, you can extend them massively. This is a really simple one, but I find that it Really, it really does a great job of expressing the intent of what I'm trying to describe. Um, so we've got an enum called game mode, and you're either in the main menu, you're playing the game, or you're finishing. And then in state, we add a variable, and this just stores which mode we're currently using. And because uh, enums can also have implemented functions, which I find um, sorry, not, uh, because uh, game state can also have implemented functions in addition to that required by the trait. Um, I went ahead and created a function called new that returns a state. Um, these are typically called constructors. Um, Rust isn't very strict about what you name your constructors. You typically see them with names like new or default. And what the new function does there is it just sets the mode to be where we're looking at the menu. Um, we also made a function called restart. All this does is it tells it we're going to start the game or restart the game if you've previously died, and we're going to set the game mode to playing. Um, also made a function to display a main menu. This is very straightforward if you saw Hello World. Um, context CLS clears the screen. Then it prints, welcome to Flappy Dragon. Press P to play the game, Q to quit the game. Now, if let is probably my least favorite named piece of syntax, it's really the same thing as match, but just for one case. And what it's really doing here is it's telling you there's a variable in context called key, which is an option. Um, it's either none, meaning no key is pressed, or it's sum and contains a key code telling you what key was pressed. So what that does, if let sum key equal context key, which is a real mouthful, it's saying if context key matches the pattern of sum, then make a then take the variable key from inside it and make it available inside this block. And then we call match, which is like switch or case in other languages. And if it matches P, then we restart the game. If it matches Q, we tell context of quitting. Otherwise, the underbar means everything else, and Rust will not let you skip options, so you end up with a lot of everything else because you don't want to write lines of code for every possible um, character on the keyboard. Then do nothing. Um, this extends the tick function. So now we've got the game mode. We know if it's the menu, we should call the main menu. If, you're if it's game over, 
you should call dead. If you're playing the game, then you call play. Now I've actually created stubs for uh, dead. Dead looks just like the main menu, except uh, instead of saying welcome to the game, it says you are dead. And play is one line of code that simply says that you are dead. Well, uh, it's common to stub things out like this, get the basic structure of your program put together. And it does, <clears throat> and then we've extended the uh, initialization there to, uh, instead of calling state with curly brackets, it calls the constructor. And on the right, you can see the entire game flow of the uh, game we have right now. The menu comes up, you press P to play, you instantly die, you are dead, P to play again. All right, so that isn't a whole lot of fun. Um, menu quest is probably not everybody's favorite. So let's go ahead and start getting the character into the game. Now, once again, we're going to use a structure to describe the player. Structs really are ubiquitous in Rust. Um, between structures and traits, pretty much everything in the Rust standard, standard library can be built. So don't be afraid of throwing structs at problems. Now, when you look at the player, they have an X location. Now, what in this case, the bird's staying stationary. So X is describing how the bird is moving through the world, and we're actually moving the world around the bird. Um, so that way, obstacles will get closer, and we'll, we'll see a good example of that in a second. Now, the Y coordinate, just like a graph, is telling you uh, the current vertical position of the bird. And velocity, which you'll notice is a float, is uh, so you can put decimal numbers in instead of uh, having to just use whole numbers, is telling you the current vertical um, movement trajectory of the bird. And this is kept independent from y because velocity is cumulative. So as, your, uh, as gravity affects you, you start falling faster. When you flap, you start moving upwards. And these can add together to give you relatively smooth movement. Um, a new function also, this is attached to the player, uh, called render. It uh, simply sets one character on the terminal uh, to a yellow and black at symbol. I picked the at because in a lot of ASCII games, at is traditionally the player. Um, I could have picked a D for dragon, or really anything else. At this point, we're prototyping. It doesn't matter what it looks like, as long as you know what it is that you're looking at. And I decided to combine gravity and movement into one function because they naturally go together. Um, so we start off by saying, if our current velocity is less than 2, then we add 0.2 to it. Now, there's no magic in those numbers. I, as with a lot of game development, I started with other numbers. I kept changing them until I found one that I felt flowed, felt about right. Um, it's certainly not an accurate representation of gravity, although you do have terminal velocity. So um, your velocity won't get to be more than 2.0. And the reason for that was that you were falling off the screen far too rapidly if you started to allow velocity to just keep increasing. So then we add the velocity to the uh, bird's position. Uh, this will mean if you're not flapping, then you're continually falling. If uh, Now y0 is the top of the screen. So if you've fallen off the top of the screen, we're going to clamp you to it. So you can't just flap off the screen and win the game. And then we've made a function called flap. This sets the velocity to minus 2. Now, as you saw above, we're adding velocity to fall downwards. So subtracting velocity makes you jump upwards. And rather than, modif rather than adding it to the current velocity, which would mean you had to absolutely pound the spacebar if you want to reverse a hard fall, we're just going to let the bird move upwards right away. And that also means that you can't press the spacebar really, really fast and shoot off the top of the screen. So now that we've created player, um, all that remains is to add the player into the state that we've been carrying around with us. Also added in a function, a variable called frame time. Uh, we'll talk about exactly what that does in a second, but it's important that we set it to zero. And uh, we'll be using it to make sure that the game runs at the same speed on different computers. All right, so the play function, instead of just setting you to dead, can be wired up relatively simply. Um, CLSBG sets the screen to blue. Um, then we add the 
uh, context frame time ms, which is the number of milliseconds that this frame took to render to our frame time. If it's greater than frame duration, which um, I slowed down to 15 frames a second so I could record these GIFs. Normally I have it set at about 30. Um, then we reset frame time and we apply gravity and movement. So uh, we're not applying gravity and movement in all the times that we're arriving faster than we're ready for the data. That way if you run it on a slow computer or a fast computer, it renders, it, the uh, physics ticks along at the same speed. And it's pretty important that you remember to do that because otherwise um, you can make a game that runs beautifully on a slow computer and is completely unplayable uh, when you give it to your friend who's just bought the latest and greatest gaming rig. Then we use if let again to see if space was pressed. If the space bar is pressed, we flap our wings. Then we call the player render function we created. I added a press space to flap because it's always a good idea to tell your players what to do. And lastly, if player Y falls off the bottom of the screen, screen height, then we set it to end the game. And on the right here, you can see the game is running. The, uh, you flap a few times, eventually gravity gets the better of you, you're dead, and the game is over. And that's actually all you need to mod model the movement of the bird. So the next element that we're going to look at is obstacles. Um, Obstacles are really a key part of making Flappy Bird an interesting game. If there was nothing uh, whizzing on the screen for you to uh, dodge, then you'd have absolutely nothing to do, and you wouldn't get the horrible impact end game and the adrenaline that keeps you playing. So we're going to uh, go ahead and use a struct to define an obstacle. Um, now, if you remember, we're increasing the bird's X position every turn. Now, we, the X position des describes, um, for the bird, is describing how far along in the world I am. For the obstacle, it's also saying where I am in world space, and will then be transformed into screen space with the effect that the obstacle is getting closer and closer and closer to the bird, even though in real terms, the obstacle is staying in the same point and the bird is flying along. We'll worry about that in just a second. We also, um, if you look at Flappy Bird, every gap, Sorry, every wall has a gap. So we're defining the Y position of that gap. And then size is how big is the gap. So when we create a new obstacle, giving it a constructor, we uh, roll a dice with the random number generator and place it somewhere between 10 and 40 on the Y scale. Um, that just <coughs> guarantees that it won't be at the very top or the very bottom, but it'll be on the screen. And then we're using the max function to pick the larger of 2 or 20 minus the current score. So what you can get is when you're just starting out, you have nice big gaps as you're playing, as you play, get more obstacles, pass more obstacles. Um, your score goes up and the game gets harder and harder. But we don't want it ever to become completely impossible because that gives you a maximum bound of what score anybody could ever have. So we set 2 as the lower ceiling of that. Um, which will give you a relatively small gap, but still playable. And hopefully you can still get a little bit of competition between people for um, how high can my score go. So rendering the obstacles is a little more complicated. So I put in this graphic actually from the book showing you um, how the gap is defined. So gap Y is defining the center point of the gap. And then there's going to be above it, um, half the size in the top half of the gap, and below it, half the size in the bottom half of the gap. Um, so we start off by transforming screen X, which is the current X minus the player X. That, get, that gives you the effect, once again, of moving the world around the bird instead of vice versa. Calculate half size. We're using half the size. Makes sense to just calculate it once. Most of the time, the, op the uh, compiler optimizer will Notice that you're using it twice and not penalize you, but it, it's always good to be clear. So for the top half, we draw from zero all the way down to the gap minus half the gap. I picked red and black pipes. You could really use anything you want. And then again, for the second half, you take the gap Y plus half the size, and you draw down to the very bottom of the screen. And then we, then we create a function called hit obstacle. Um, 
Once again, we calculate half the size. Does X match is saying, is the uh, player um, adjacent to the wall? If the player is not, there's no point in um, really calculating anything else, because if the player is not next to the wall, they can't hit it. Then we check, is the player above the gap or below the gap? As if X matches, and you're either above the gap or below the gap, which is what the OR symbol is telling you there, then you've smacked into the wall. Game over. You return true. Otherwise, you return false, and the bird keeps flapping. So once again, in the state, you store your obstacle. Um, in the new, you create a new obstacle at the very right-hand side of the screen so that you don't start needing to immediately um, flex your reflexes. I've also introduced a new variable called score because you saw it in the obstacle. And so when you create a new game, you set the score to zero. You also repeat this code in restart. Over in the tick function, it's actually pretty simple to uh, wire this up. You add obstacle render to the uh, um, to the tick function, and it renders the obstacle. If then you check if the player x is greater than the obstacle's x, add one to the score because they've passed the obstacle, and make a new obstacle. Again, at the right hand side of the screen. Um, and then when you're checking to see have they fallen off the bottom of the screen for gravity, it's or have they hit the obstacle. If they have, then it's game over. And that's actually all you need to get a functional flappy bird. However, it's kind of ugly. So we're going to take a moment to uh, turn this into a much prettier game. Um, the... <clears throat> Biggest change here was that uh, I explicitly set the score to zero because I forgot to do that earlier. Um, and then on display, uh, in the play function, when it uh, tells you press space to flap, we've added a line, um, print the current score. Now th you'll notice this uses the format macro, which is one of the uh, really most beautiful macros in Rust. You can format just about anything. The amount of control that you get is incredible. And we've extended the dead function to say, you are dead, you have earned placeholder points, with the placeholder being filled with self.score. That's simple, but it's very useful. You should always um, reward your player. You get a great endorphin rush when you see your, sc your score going up. All right, so this is the ugly version. As you can see, you can flap, you can play. And we hit the wall, you're dead, you earned one point. So now let's add some graphics. Um, bracket lib by default um, works with a um, PNG file containing the current font. Uh, they're monospaced because I'm emulating an old style screen terminal. And the quickest and easiest way to add graphics is to take that font and replace some of the characters. Uh, for example, you can see here we have a wall character. We have multiple frames of flapping bird. And we have an obstacle. And the ground goes at the bottom. All of these came from opengameart.org, a site I highly recommend. Um, when you do search there, make sure that you see the license and pick a license that's compatible with what you want to use. These were all Creative Commons Zero, meaning use them for whatever you like. So animation frames, like I like you saw, there were, th um, there were a total of four graphics there representing the dragon. And they run in order. So you start off with the dragon with his wings up, then down a little more towards the bottom, starting, and then you, then you go back the other way. When you combine these together, you get a nice bouncing, bouncing, flapping dragon. So in the um, in the game, we define a, f a uh, constant array called dragon frames, just listing the characters on the uh, character indices on the font map. Uh, the source code for all of this will be up in a second, so don't worry too much about following along. And we extend the player to list the current frame. 
and the and obviously we set that to zero. And now there's a slight change to the way we're rendering things. We have to tell it to use the new font file, add in a simple console, and I've added also a fancy console. Now consoles layer on top of each other, so you have um, it's much like Photoshop layers. And uh, what you'll um, what you'll see is that uh, the simple console layer render is exactly the same as the game so far. But the fancy layer lets you specify a lot more information about how and where you want to render the dragon. So you'll notice there is one change here. We have made y a floating point variable. You saw before in the ASCII version that the bird moved very stutteringly, very, very jerkily. Well, let's make that smooth. And to do that, all we really have to do is make velocity into a float instead of a y. Likewise, for in gravity and movement, we've just had to update a few things to use floating point numbers instead of integers. Um, we've also storing frame. This is the current animation frame. We set it to zero, if you remember. It adds, <coughs> every time we render the dragon, we add one to it. And the percentage six is modulo six, which is the same as a remainder. Um, if so, the frame numbers will go zero, one, two, three, four, five, and then back to zero. This will get you your animation cycle running continuously, uh, because it doesn't. We're not actually tracking how where exactly your wings are at any time. We don't really need to worry too much about where it is for collision detection or anything like that. But uh, this does make the game a whole lot prettier. In the uh, player render, because we're using the second console, you have to call active console one. Like I said, these are like Photoshop layers, so layer zero is the base text. Layer one is set aside just for the player now. Now set fancy is just like set, except that there's a whole lot more options. Um, the positions are in floating point, so point F instead of just point, and self.y is now a floating point. Um, we are not gonna rotate it or scale it. We're calling white to the dark blue background, and we're pulling the character to render out of frame. And because we changed layer, it's a good idea to change it back at the end, because otherwise you might forget and wind up with text all over the place. So with those minor changes, you've turned your ASCII version into a pretty credible game. Um, I've put all of the source code for this up on handsonrust.com. The uh, game itself is um, one change away from WebAssembly friendliness. I'll be posting an article on that next week. The uh, <coughs> and this is, like I said, the third chapter of Hands on Rust. I hope you've enjoyed it and gained something to uh, um, gain something that you feel like you can uh, build and hopefully inspire you to go forth and make something cool. And to help you make something cool, we're going to have a look at the Rust game development ecosystem. So uh, full disclosure, first of all, Amethyst are actually the sponsors of two of my open source projects. So I have to say nice things about them. Uh, fortunately, that's pretty easy because they, uh, they are actually a really great bunch of guys, nice to work with. Now we're going to focus initially on the Amethyst engine and the Bevy engine. But first, what don't we have? Uh, this is something I get asked a lot, and Rust at this point does not have what I call a batteries included engine like Unity, Unreal 4, or Godot. Um, I don't know if you've used Unreal, but it, it's really quite amazing. The first time you pull up the editor, download some marketplace assets, drag a dragon onto the screen, drag a jeep onto the screen, scroll out a bit of terrain, hit play, and you've got a, an animated flapping dragon who doesn't do anything, and a jeep on the screen, and you can move the camera around. And then with a bit of drag and drop, you can turn that into a playable but simple game pretty quickly. So unfortunately, Rust does not have that yet. What it does have is plugins for both Unity and Unreal that let you write Rust code that interface with the Unreal or Unity engine and provide some of the safety, which is especially useful when you're writing in Unreal. Um, now, the only downside is you can get into second syndrome, second system syndrome. Uh, sorry, that's a tongue twister. Um, 
where you have to find everything in Rust, it looks beautiful, and then you have to make sure you output everything um, into Unreal. That's a really common problem when you're calling things cross-language. You do wind up duplicating yourself a little bit, actually, as you saw in the previous excellent talk. Um, but Rust is gaining a lot of popularity amongst uh, game developers in general um, for making tools. It's not really there yet for making a full-featured um, next Assassin's Creed, but it is getting there. So the um, both Amethyst and Bevy are entity component systems based. Now, what an entity component system is is it's a way to uh, represent most of your game as data and decouple having um, functions attached to all of your data. Instead, you have systems that treat your ECS like a SQL database. So you might say um, I want to apply gravity, so I need all entities that know where they are in the world and don't have a tag indicating that they can fly. So then your system would go through and apply a downwards momentum to every item. Now, Amethyst and then Bevy also extend this a bit by providing you with a bunch of pre-made components. So you could say that orgs have a display component that makes them look like a nasty little green critter. They have a position component. But then you would write some game logic that says, look at all the position components, if they're find things that are adjacent, and they attack each other. And so Amethyst is currently in the process of being rewritten. The first version used specs. It's currently rewriting to Legion. It is quite popular for 2D and 3D systems, and you can make some really quite advanced stuff with it. Uh, the tutorials are pretty decent, and the Amethyst community are extremely friendly. Um, now, Amethyst is a very slow trajectory for development. It, they take their time. They try to make things work when they release them. Um, so if you want to spend a long time on a project, Amethyst is pretty safe, because the chances are they're not going to pull too much of the rug out from under you. Uh, now, the slow trajectory uh, upset and bothered a few people, so Bevy came along. Uh, the author, primary author of Bevy describes it as being Amethyst 2.0. Um, I know there are some discussions between the groups. It may yet be Amethyst 2.0. And it is under massive development. I, pretty much every time I look at Rust Game Dev forums, something new with Bevy has come out. And that is amazing. It's also really frustrating if you're trying to make a large project with it. I would recommend waiting a little bit because uh, you either find yourself having to freeze and stick to a certain API level, or you find yourself rewriting things quite a lot. And that's inevitable in the, in the early stages of any sort of engine. But uh, it, does make, it does make for a rather frustrating time. Um, now, Bevy is becoming very popular for 2D and simpler 3D games. I've seen everything from 3D chess to uh, Pong to uh, um, Missile Defense written in it. It's got some really nice tricks, like hot reloading. They're really working hard on uh, user interface layer. And the intent is that once the UI layer works, you'll start to get an editor. And the editor is partly inspired by one Rust project that I recommend keeping an eye on, RG3D. Just like Amethyst and Bevy, it's free, open source, no cost, Libra and Libra. Um, it's also under heavy development. And it's already hit the point that they have a functional 3D editor, map editor, um, a certain amount of network code. And you can make uh, beautiful looking first person shooter type games uh, or third person that look like the screenshots you see on the right. They have really been coming along fast and furious. Every time I look at their website, they're producing something more beautiful. So the idea is that eventually some of this technology will end up in Bevy and or Amethyst. For now, if you want to live on the bleeding edge, this is a project to watch. All right, wrapping up. Um, as I mentioned a couple of times, I'm the author of Hands on Rust, Effective Learning Through 2D Game Development and Play. That's quite a mouthful. Um, I've put the source code for everything in this presentation, and I'll be putting the slides up later on handsonrust.com, the book's website. Now, the book is in beta, and I 
personally thought it was kind of weird the books have a beta. Um, I'd never heard of that before. But the growth of ebooks makes this possible. So version one com comes up. Everybody who buys the book is guaranteed to get all of the future versions, including the final release, just as an ebook. But they're kind enough to send me errata and bug reports. So sub successive versions have been getting better and better. We're up to beta six now. It's currently off with the slightly serpentine process of production, which is how it becomes a final, uh, hopefully beautiful, layout, um, properly laid out and spelling corrected uh, ebook. And it will also be available in full color on paper. Um, right now, you can get the beta on pragprog.com. If you use the coupon RustLens, uh, that'll get you a 10% discount for the next month or so. Um, the print version, you can pre order on Amazon. Waterstones, your favorite bookseller, um, should be available either late June or early July, depending on how bad my spelling is with the copywriters. All right, if you need to contact me, I am at Herberticus on Twitter, the bracket on Reddit, and I'm in the Discord. Um, I just before I go to questions, I'd just like to say thank you so much for having me. It really is an honor to uh, virtually travel around the world and talk to people who love the same things I do. I'm hoping when there's less of a pandemic issue um, that I can hopefully come and do some of this in person. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, <laughs> Herbert. Thank you, thank you very much. It was a really inspiring talk and just to share one piece of feedback that we got, you see, Ewald was talking, wow, this was really <laughs> eye-opening. I really enjoyed it. Ah, it was so interesting. You know, uh, le let me give you a quick personal background. Uh, as one of the mentors of the Code of Dojo Linz, the programming club for kids, I spent every single week, um, many hours with, uh, with, with pupils, uh, starting at, let's say, eight, nine, something like this, building simple games. So I 100% agree <laughs> to your saying that Building simple games is a great way of learning languages. And I very much enjoyed what you showed us with, with Flappy Bird. So, yeah, I think you just changed my mind about whether we should try Rust, even for relative beginners. And that is my first question to you. What do you think? Compared to all the languages that you have learned, what is the, the amount of experience that a young coder should have in your um, in your opinion to start learning Rust. Is it a good first language? Is it a good second language? Should they already learn C before they approach Rust? What is your point of view on that? I would love to hear that. All right, so um, I actually spent the last couple of years helping a whole lot of people learn Rust, which is fantastic. Um, and my experience so far is that it's a great second language. Your first language should probably be something like Python, basic, uh, something simple enough that it won't bite you too hard when, while you're still figuring out what is a variable. Um, because Rust is a great ergonomic language, but it doesn't have, um, at least until the publisher lets me write it, it doesn't have something to really come in, in with what is a variable, what is a loop. And you kind of need to know that before you get into Rust. So it's a really good idea to start with something like Python, um, make something simple. And then when you, want, when you feel like you're ready to make your second game, Rust is right there. And you realize, OK, so Rust really does abbreviate everything. So you know, FNs and MUTs and everything everywhere. But it's not so scary, because I've seen all of this working in another language. And also, the Rust ecosystem is coming a long way. I mean, Clippy has got to the point now that uh, for half the common mistakes, it tells you not only you did this wrong, but here's the correct version. And so I think, I don't know, Rust is very close to that tipping point where it would be a good first language, but we're not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. We, we do a lot of work with the JavaScript uh, language for, for kids. So we start with online development environments and maybe Rust would really be a good, a good second language. My second talk would, uh, my second question would be maybe I, maybe I'm, uh, I, I don't know a, a tool for, for beginners. 
I love web-based development environments. Do you know of any web-based development environments with which somebody, a beginner, could build a simple program without having to set up the entire tooling and Rust and, and installing Visual Studio Code and things like that? You know, that's kind of a hurdle, and I would love to hear your thoughts on how we can make it as simple as possible for beginners to get Rust running on their machine. Um, for uh, basic um, console-based programs, um, on the Ru main Rust website, there's a Rust playground. Um, I actually use this all the time for uh, just demoing something quick and simple. Um, it's, <clears throat> it's not so good when you want to make something complicated. If you just want to show off a concept, it's great. Mm -hmm. Now, I wish I could remember the link. I'll try and find it and send it to you. But there was a fellow a few months ago I saw was working on a WebAssembly Rust playground. And it was coming along really nicely. You could start to define um, much more complicated programs. It compiled them into WASM and then ran them in your browser. That right away gives you access to OpenGL, sound libraries, and all sorts of more complicated features. Um, I just wish I could remember the name of it. I'm sorry, I'll look that up. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Stefan, do you have any any questions that you would like to ask or add? No, I don't have any questions. I'm, I'm just... Uh, um, so first, I'm very surprised that I'm already here. My kids are asleep uh, uh, way too early now. <laughs> that's, that's, that's fun as I am. And I was able to catch that the latter half of the talk. So that was that was very nice. Um, and congratulations on your book. So I'm oh, I'm, 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 I'm a book collector. So I, I ordered basically every Rust book from from every publisher that that has printed books. You're still on, on my list. But I I guess I've, I give the 10% discount a go. <laughs> uh, sounds good. Um, yeah, I've always wanted to write a book. Um, I, my parents are both teachers. I grew up seeing authors as sort of the ultimate people. And so this, this for me was just, you know, a bucket list item. It was something I've always wanted to do. And so far, I'm just enjoying every minute of it. Cool. So it's your first book? It's my first printed book. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah I've written lots of articles, but. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, awesome. I'm curious if you if you ever have the urge then for a second book because it's it I guess when it's out it feels like um, yeah just like I said a bucket list icon and my milestone and I uh, wonder when you get the itch again for a second book. I've got to tread carefully on that one because I'm in the aid. See? So I can confirm that there is a book, but I can't tell you what it is. Ah, okay. Ah. Cool. Already. Um, yeah, they actually approached me before I finished this one. So cool. That's great. Looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. um, I've written two books and I had exactly the same situation. I said <laughs> yes to the second book before I really <laughs> finished the first one and I wasn't really aware of what I'm saying yes to. But at the end, uh, it was it was pretty nice. Yeah, writing a book is really a lot of work, um, but uh, it pays off. It, it's really a nice, nice thing. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. I think with that, we are through. I also, if I take a look at the watch, we hit today the two hour mark that we have set for our meetup. Exactly. It's 7.30 <laughs> here. And yeah, Herbert, at this point, we have to say thank you very much for, for this talk. We really enjoyed it. And whenever your book is ready or when you have something to tell us about your second book, whatever, you're always welcome as a speaker here at the Rust Meetup Linz. Thank you very well, much for you. virtually traveling, traveling from the United States to, to Linz. And I will pop into the Discord in a few minutes. I have to run across town first, and I'll um, post links to the slides and the code there. Oh, that is very nice for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.